We are joined by the best-selling author of the Tom Thorne novels and many standalone novels as well, uh, Mr. Mark Billingham. Thank you, Mark. Hello. Um, so today you're going to share with us your top 10 crime novels. Well, my top 10 crime novels as of today. As of I mean, today. That's, that's always the thing with lists, isn't it? Because it changes every five minutes. But, but here's, but here's ten, I mean, you know, probably six or seven of these would be on my top 10 crime novels whenever. Yeah. But as of today, these are my top 10. Okay. All right. Have you got a number one? Order? Well, number one is probably number one. The okay. rest of them, the rest of them. So number one, top of the tree for me always is the Maltese Falcon. Um, by Dashiell Hammett. Um, it's, you know, routinely described as the greatest crime novel of all time, the greatest mystery novel of all time. It's certainly an important novel because it kick-started the whole hard-boiled movement, um, you know, Chandler and the people that came later. But I just think it's a great novel as well. It has, you know, the, ho the whole stuff about the, the Falcon, that's not the mystery at the heart of the novel. You know, that's the greatest MacGuffin of all time. The mystery is the character of Sam Spade, this iconic detective only ever appeared in one book, and you never really know what he's up to. You know, he's, he's ostensibly quite a, a dark character. There's, there's very few, I don't think there's any nice characters in the book. Um, amazing cast of characters, you know, and people probably know it all from the, the Humphrey Bogart film. But the original book, 90 years on from, from, from when it was written, is still just fizzing and fantastic. You know, you can read it in a day, read it. When did you first read that book? Um, oh, way back, way back when I was a student, I bought an edition, uh, Dashiell Hammett, The Five Great Novels big big thick picador edition um it wasn't even it wasn't even hammett's favorite novel of, of his novels um you know he didn't write many novels um he wrote an awful lot of fantastic short stories you know with the continental op and like i say sam spade only appeared in one book and thank god actually because you know if the whole diminishing law of diminishing returns in series who knows how sam spade would have ended up but you know he's one of the great iconic detectives just based on this one fantastic book Okay, next up. All right, next up we got Red Dragon, Thomas Harris. Um, I could have gone for Silence of the Lambs, but be, but this is the first appearance of Hannibal Lecter. And I remember picking this up at, at an airport somewhere and just not putting it down for like two days, you know, while I was eating, uh, which was a bit messy. Um, <laughs> it's been fit tw two movies made of it, one, one great yeah. Manhunter and one not so great Red Dragon. Um, but it's just it's just the most fantastic sort of glimpse of, of of a monster made flesh. You know, this is when Hannibal Lecter was great and interesting. I think he became a lot less interesting in the later books when mm. when Thomas Harris decided oh, to explain him. You know, oh, Hannibal Lecter was like that because he had to eat his sister. Oh, you know, oh, fine, I get it now. But it's much it's much more interesting when you don't know, don't you? There's that great moment in the movie when when Jodie Foster says, you know, what happened to you, Doctor Lecter? And he goes, nothing happened to me. I happened, and that's. That's what you want. He's just his force of nature, and yeah, Red Dragon his first appearance. Yeah, Red Dragon I think is is would be my choice over Silence of Lambs all day, and I, I, and I completely agree that the night it was it was when was the um, when was the Man, Man Hunter film made? Was that in the eighties? Um, I don't know. It's, um, it's Silence of Lambs was it was nineties, and it was way before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with, of course, Brian, Brian Cox. Cox. Brian yeah. Cox is Hannibal Lecter. The proper and Brian it, Cox. <laughs> I think the problem is the problem is that Thomas Harris and everybody else fell a bit too much in love with Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. You know, and he and he became the major character. He became the the thing. I remember queuing up outside Murder One Bookshop um, at midnight when Hannibal was released. You know, however many years, thirteen years or something. In the, in the making. And they had like Hannibal Lecter lookalikes and they were serving fava beans and Chianti. And he just became a bit of a kind of, you know, um, too much of an iconic figure. And like I say, then, then Harris spoiled it by explaining him. Mm. Okay, next up. Next up, we got The Long and Far Away Gone by Lou Burney, which is probably the best book I read last year. Just, um, I'd, I'd, I'd met Lou a couple of times at, at uh, conventions and stuff in America and, uh, kept hearing his name mentioned, he kept winning all these awards, and I thought, I've got to read this guy. This is a fantastic book. It's just brilliant. It's uh, so 25 five years on from a, from a robbery, um, uh, robbery murder at a movie theatre, and the disappearance of a young girl at the Oklahoma State Fair. Two survivors of these two traumatic incidents kind of uh, struggle to come to terms with these, with these horrible past. There's no easy answers for them, and, and Lou Burney doesn't do anything simple like make them get together or anything like that. They have these kind of parallel lives. It's just beautifully written, 
beautifully written. And I read a later book of his, the most recent book, uh, after that, November Road, which is just gobsmacking. I mean, the guy is such a great writer. You know, just write sentences that make you think, I should just give up. Yeah. But yeah, long and far away gone, Blue Bernie. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good shot. November Road is an incredible novel. It's awesome, isn't it? Absolutely awesome. Uh, it's 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 always good when you see these these lists because you always expect there will, there will always be books that were written thirty years ago and then earlier. Is that we still are producing crime novels to this day? Oh God, yeah. Oh, God, on yeah. Lists. Nothing I love more than reading a, a you know a, a recent novel. God forbid a debut novel, which just <laughs> knocks which knocks your socks off. You just go, how can you be this good straight yeah. out the straight out the traps? You know. <laughs> okay, next up. Next up, we've got oh, a book. I don't know whether you know this book, a book called Night Dogs by Kent Anderson. Don't know that one. Okay, so this is uh, 96, and this is the best cop novel ever written. Uh, it, features, it features this character, Hansen, who's this sort of damaged Vietnam vet, uh, set in the summer of 1975 in Portland. Um, honestly, it makes, it makes Joseph Wambaugh look like an episode of Midsummer Murders. I mean, it's so, it's so kind of... Uh, it's eviscerating and kind of so such a powerful book i've never forgotten it um night dogs not many people know it it's a, it's a bit of a cult book but it should... where's it where's that set did you say in portland oregon portland oregon so it's an american author i imagine and what, what yeah yeah, the... yeah yeah i don't even recall the author's name to be honest well there's two it's, it's, it's this is kent anderson there's another american crime writer called kent harrington which right. is quite confusing but this is this is kent anderson it, 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 it's a fantastic fantastic book night dogs Night dogs. Okay, that's one on my list. All right. <laughs> Next up, somebody we both know very well. Uh, this is A Place of Execution by Val McDermott. Okay. Um, and, and this is my favourite book of hers. It's not a book in the series. Um, this won the LA Times Book Award uh, a few years back, quite deservedly. It's set in, I think, 62, 63. It's about the disappearance of a young girl in rural Derbyshire and about the cop copper who's kind of obsessed with the case and it's just fantastic I mean it's meticulously researched so all the period stuff is brilliant um and it really looks at what a crime does to a community which is what the best crime writers do right they look at they look at the effects of a mm. violent crime on people without dwelling on the violent crime itself um no this is Val absolutely at her very best all the twists and shocks you'd expect definitely my favorite her books yeah I mean because people usually lean on mermaid singing when they talk about Val's best player it's like uh, whenever yeah. I say it's like they always say mermaid singing, and and I I think, hip, it, I agree. Place of execution, I think, is better because of the way it looks at the victims and the way. Well, mermaid singing was probably Val's breakthrough book. You know, yeah. won the Gold Dagger and introduced Tony Hill and Carol Jordan and everything. But th this is the one I would always go back to. Yeah, I agree with that one. Go on, next one. What's next? Talented Mr. Ripley, Patricia Highsmith. Uh, it's just the most. Ripley is just the most chilling description, chilling portrayal of this sort of con man and serial killer and psychopath and fantastic American anti-hero. Um, you know, it, 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 in an era that celebrated, you know, wealth and status above wisdom or accomplishment, Ripley's completely without conscience, completely without conscience, perfect earliest 20th century protagonist, probably be president these days. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, you know, uh, Talented Mr. Ripley, I'm guessing, was, was Talented Mr. Ripley the first one in the Ripley ad? I'm not yeah. even sure of that. I'm is. guessing it was. But there's also like, all sorts of Ripley's Game and Ripley Underwater and all over, but this is, this, is, this is the one to read. Do you think Patricia Highsmith has become, uh, has had a bit of a resurgence lately because of the, the whole domestic noir genre psychological thriller? Oh, definitely, and there were a few, big movies, a few yeah. big movies based on her books. It kind of annoyed me when the whole uh, domestic noir, whatever you want to call it, uh, sort of exploded as if it was this brand new thing yeah. and you had to go hello uh ruth rendell hello patricia highsmith you know people have been writing this stuff for a long time yeah. um it's just become very very fashionable lately and there's a lot of brilliant writers writing these psychological thrillers but yeah but highsmith was just fine you know she's she's kind of a cold she's a very interesting woman she was a very interesting woman um uh i i, I know somebody who used to be her editor reasonably well and he's got some stories, shall we say. <laughs> what are we up to? What number are we up to? What we're up to? We're up to one, two, three, four, five, six. This is number seven, seven. on the list. Like I say, they're in no particular order other than Maltese Falcon. This is um, The Big Blowdown, George Pelicanos. Um, Pelicanos is just one of my favourite, favourite writers. Um, 
he's happy to call himself a crime writer, but I think he's way more than that. And this is really an epic book. It's kind of the tale of what of, of Washington's uh, immigrant community through from uh, the early 30s through to the end of the 50s. Really epic book. Um, it's gripping. It's heartbreaking. It's exciting. People people probably know uh, George Best as 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 people probably know George Best. No, but people <laughs> probably know George Pelicano. Pelicanos Best as a writer and producer on The Wire mm. and on The Juice and that kind of stuff. And in recent years, he has concentrated on working in television. But if you have not read his books, I mean, you are in for such a treat. And this, I would say, is his masterpiece. Is he, are you a fan of his? Yeah, I mean, I haven't read as much as I should have done because what I have read is remarkable. Um, but I, I, it's one of those where you you kind of leave it on the shelf and you and you pick up whatever's there. And it, that, yeah. that one I always got. But everything I've read by him has been incredible. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I should read more by him, and I think everyone should, really. But he has become way more well-known for his TV work. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. he's always loved, loved TV and film. I mean, he's from a sort of film background before yeah. he started writing, you know. Um, but he's just one of, those, one of those writers that can't write a bad sentence, writes the most yeah. brilliant, brilliant dialogue. No, he's ace. Well, yeah, I was going to mention dialogue is yeah. is the thing for me, and maybe that's why he works well so well on TV. Because if you ever look at a TV script, a lot of it, it it's driven by dialogue. You well, know? I would say what it, it's something all these books have in common is mm. fantastic dialogue because that's what I look for. That's what I hone in on as a reader. Because I don't care if you can write the most beautiful descriptions of a landscape. If you've got a tin ear for dialogue, I'm yeah. not. I'm not interested. You know, dialogue is everything. Uh, excellent. Okay. No right. Worries. What we got next? Dare Me by Megan Abbotts. Um, yes. Got to put a Megan Abbott yeah. book on the list. And I could have picked one of the early ones. I could have picked Queen Pin or The Song Is You. But I've gone for this one because people might know it because of the, the recent TV Netflix TV series. Um, uh, her stuff is called Suburban Noir. Um, we always have to give things a name. Um, she's just a brilliant, brilliant writer. This is about, you know, the, the tensions, the murderous tensions within, a, within and around a team of cheerleaders. It's it's Heather's meets Fight Club, and you know you need to read Megan Abbott. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, when I discovered her books, I didn't realize crime fiction kind of had that that within it. You know, it was like I, I didn't realize how broad it could be. Absolutely, it's and and it's it, the, the the word I always use for for her books is that they're just absorbent because you will just lose yourself and you realize three hours have gone by. You know, it's yeah. just you can't stop. You know, you're just in that immersed in that world that she's created, and she always takes like these uh, situations that you wouldn't expect to, a, a novel to be sustained by. You know, she like she's, she's unique. No book, no book is like any other book. No, you know, I mean, an awful lot of us you could get books seven and nine confused, or you know <laughs> what I mean. But not, but not Megan. She never writes the same book twice. No. no. So what we got left? We got two left. Two left. Slow horses, Mick Heron. Oh yes. <laughs> um, this is, uh, Mick is a national treasure, uh, and these books have, I, I was never really a fan of, of an espionage novel. I'd read a few, big James Bond fan, big Ian Fleming fan, um, and I kept hearing Mick's name, and I kept seeing people reading the book, people within our business mm. reading the book. What is it? Who is this guy? Um, and he kept winning awards right, left, and center. So I read Slow Horses, which is the first one of his Slough House novels. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know, it's basically about a group of kind of MI5 fuck-ups who have dropped the ball and they've all been kind of shunted to this sort of horrible, dank, grim little building in London where they can't do any, get up to any mischief, but of course they do. Um, largely because of the person who's their boss, who is this incredible character called Jackson Lamb, who is just one of the greatest creations in the history of, of thriller fiction uh just kind of gross and over the top and unpleasant and you love him you know just one of those characters um the books are all just fabulous every one of them he's a brilliant writer they're also laugh out loud funny i mean he's one of those writers that can really weave black humor into the books um so slow horses is the first one read them all read yeah. them all read them in order if you can doesn't really matter but yeah i started with slow horses and, I, and i'm gagging for the next one I think that I think Mick Heron is is one of those that if you speak to any crime writer, it it they even know someone who is who's telling them to read it, or they've already read it and not telling other people to read them. He's just oh, yeah. he, he became that real word of mouth 
sensation, I think, within the genre and then it expanded outwards. Well, yeah, you're passionate about them because the books are so great. Yeah. Um, and if that wasn't bad enough, he's also just a lovely bloke. He so, is you know, a lovely guy. He's desperately really trying to force Mick, Mick Heron books on people. <laughs> okay, your last one and your last top one. Then. Okay, and, and this is, well, pound for pound, I think this guy's probably the best crime writer on the planet. Who am I picking? <laughs> I'm not guessing, Justin Cleaver. Right. It's me, I'm isn't picking, it? It's I'm, me. Oh, thanks, Mark. <laughs> I'm picking The Poet by Michael Connolly. Yeah. Um, now, he's best known, he's best known, obviously, for the Harry Bosch novels. This isn't a Harry Bosch novel. This, this was his first standalone novel. Um, and the first of his novels that I read, again, you know, I picked it up in a shop or an airport. You just go, this is fantastic. And then you look at the, you know, look at the cover, you know, the inside thing and you go, oh, he's written, there's four or five before this. So then I went back and read The Black Echo, which is the first Harry Bosch novel. And that series in itself, to maintain the level of quality he has maintained over such a long-running series, is amazing. And for it to have spun off into a fantastic TV show, which he's involved in, Bosch, is just brilliant. But the poet is fantastic. The poet, the central character of the poet is a, is a journalist called Jack McAvoy. And Jack McAvoy is in Connolly's forthcoming book which I can't wait for. Fair warning, which is coming out quite soon. But the, the poet is just brilliant. Connolly is just a fantastic writer. It's just kind of effortless. He makes it look effortless. Mm. No, I, I, yeah, Michael Connolly is an incredible... It, it's, uh, it, the point about the series is, is, is key for me, is that shows the, the level of what he's writing at, is that he manages to do something about series that is really difficult to do, is that every book... Is is just as good as the lot, you know, or better. Oh, I know, and it's oh, incredibly difficult to do with the series. There's always you always kind of go, well, I didn't like number twelve as much as I like number fourteen. You know, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, you might not like number twelve as much as number fourteen, but number twelve is still pretty bloody and that's great. The thing. You know, yeah. that's the thing. <laughs> but and 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 that's the thing with, with him is that I could never say that that one wasn't. I didn't enjoy that one as much as the other ones. It, it, it's just incredibly talented in that way. Um, and sadly, that's one of his I haven't actually read. Oh, really? Yeah, so I'm going to have to read that now. I, I guess you always remember the first one. You always remember the first one you read. And uh, so for me, it's the poet. Like I said at the start, mate, it, it, if you'd asked me this tomorrow, it might, it might be a different list. So many other fantastic novels I could have picked. But for now, right this minute today, that is 10 novels that everybody has to read. And I know where you live. So go out and buy them immediately. <laughs> 